Buffalo Soldiers. Who were these guys? How did they get a start? What difference did they make? The story goes back to just west of Butler, Missouri in Bates County, about 60 miles south of Kansas City, Missouri. But the story before that actually had its beginning in Kansas. Just across the state line, you had black folks that were running away. Some were free, but they were headed to Kansas just to join in what they knew was a possibility to serve in the military. Now the backstory on that one gets very interesting because you see, they were not authorized. No one was authorized to raise colored troops. There was a senator, Jim Lane, this guy did things his own way. Lane was a man among men, and he was also a brigadier general for the United States Army and had the power to recruit. But he used that power, looking at all that manpower of black men around, and of course with Kansas being a free state, he did enlist two regiments, the first Kansas colored and the second Kansas colored. And he outfitted these boys from the ground up. Many of them never done anything but slave work. Most illiterate. But he turned these guys into troops in a matter of just a couple of months. Well, there was a need over in Missouri and Bates County to root out some of the rebels that had been running wild over there. These guys were guerrillas though. When I say rebels, I'm not talking about Confederate forces. I'm talking about Confederate sympathizers for the Confederate cause. But these guys, as guerrillas, they fought war their own way. They didn't have to answer to a line of generals in Washington, D.C. They were themselves their own command. Some of them you know pretty well. <clears throat> they were the Red Legs and Bloody Bill Anderson. And uh, it was just a rough time. But it was known that over in Bates County, there was a place called Hog Island. Hog Island was no little bitty place. It was an island that was three miles long and about a mile wide, set in between two large streams. Well, that's a considerable piece of property down there, but it was a stronghold for all of the Confederate guerrillas that were in the area. Now, talking about these Confederate guerrillas, these guys were battle-hardened, they were good riders, they were equipped, they knew how to fight and shoot, they had everything they needed. Most importantly, these guys were part of the biggest and baddest bands of guerrillas that you had running around in that part of Kansas and Missouri. Something had to be done about it. It's not so much the citizens in the area of Butler or Bates County that was saying, come help us. It was that the Union needed to force those guys out of that area, get them away, because they were using that area as their playground and their supply depot. Well, in order to break that stranglehold, somebody had to go in there and route them out. Well, Jim Lane and his boys, they thought they could do it. They took those raw recruits. None had ever been in battle. Took part of First Color Infantry and marched those guys from Fort Lincoln, just across the Kansas line. Marched them into Bates County. They were infantry, so this is the way they, they moved. There was only about 240 of those guys. They were all black, the American flag in front of them. Now officers were white, for the most part. Well, coming up that road toward what was the Toothman Farm. Toothman was a family that lived on that property nearest Hog Island. This Toothman was a sympathizer to the Confederate cause, even though that cause brought her trouble whenever they wanted supplies and animals and feed and food for themselves. Whatever they needed, they took. 
But nevertheless, she was no sympathizer to those guys in blue that came marching up that road. Like I say, only 240 of them. Well, I command to march his troops up to the gate of the Toothman House and walked forward and gentlemanly introduced himself, not telling her all of why he was there, but asked her a few questions, one of which was, we understand that somewhere around here there's an encampment of guerrillas. She said, yeah, right over there about two miles, there's Hog Island. They be staying over there. Well, his next question was, yeah, so about how many do you think? She says, oh, must be 500 to 700 of them over there. Now, I can't say for certain, but I can sure tell you, as far as I believe, that commander must have been thinking, oh my goodness, what am I into now? I've got 240 raw recruits. The only time they shot a gun was in practice on a range, and they never had the gun shot at them while they were practicing. And they've got me outnumbered, out experienced, out, -quip out equipped. Well, orders are orders. The commander knew what he had to do. One of the first things he did was to establish a post out of the Toothman farm. Now, Miss Toothman, furthermore, wasn't very happy to have these visitors because her son at the time, her baby boy, was in prison over just across that line from Kansas, and he was at Fort Lincoln, held as a spy. She's not at all happy with anybody over that. But nevertheless, here they go, setting up her farm as a fort. And they named it Fort Africa. Now, I got no idea how happy that might have made Miss Toothman that here she was on her farm. Now they're calling it Fort Africa. But there was very little <coughs> she could do about it. Because every one of those 240 men were armed. There was nothing she could do. The commander told his guys, listen, we're going to have to sustain ourselves here, so I want some parties to go out and forage. Go see what's in the area. We're going to need supplies. We're going to have to be self-sufficient. But the one thing I want you guys to do when you go out on foraging, don't get out of sight of the farmhouse. Make sure you stay in sight. We don't know what's out there just yet. Well, first time on any kind of maneuver, some of these guys just didn't quite remember well to stay in sight. They got just the tiniest bit out of sight over the crest of the hill. Well, that left them in a vulnerable position because the rebels had been watching all the time. They knew that troop movement. And a few of them rode out to see if they just couldn't pick them off break them up, see if they wouldn't scare and run. So they fired on them again and again and again. But they were surprised at the return fire. Some of those troops were pretty accurate too. The boys could shoot good. They emptied a few saddles and what was left rode back. And they told the rest of them, Guys, maybe we got something over here we need to go take care of. Now, it's believed that Quantrell and Bloody Bill Anderson, some of those boys on Hog Island at that time, belonged to those bands. And these are the best known, most notorious, and scariest guys you could run into. But nevertheless, orders were orders. So after they were out of sight and they were taking on fire, the gunshots that resounded back at the farm brought more troops in support out. Some of these small bands were led by scouts and sergeants, not all of them led by lieutenants and other officers. It was just a matter of them being there and having to do that job as impossible as it seemed. So when the firing went 
and the support troops came up, they came up on a lateral. They came up from the side. And they then had our troops pinned down because that cavalry, the horsemen, for the guerrillas, they were riding right through them, shooting them. And they were getting fired back. There was one instance I read about sometime thereafter that one of the Confederates shot one of the black soldiers and dismounted, went over and picked a gold watch from this guy's pocket. Well, another one of the black troops saw this, broke off fighting where he was and went after that one guerrilla that took the watch, killed him, took the watch back and said, nobody's gonna rob the bodies of our soldiers. This is the kind of fighting spirit that they had never experienced. So, with the crossfire going, they sort of turned the tables on the guerrillas. And they were able to push them back. They were able to survive. A lot of them did get wounded. One young fella said, I don't know if I shot anybody. I sure fought as hard as I could, but at least I brought my rifle back. For every small step they took, they looked at it like an achievement. Surprise was next day. Hog Island was empty. Those 500 to 700 mounted men had loaded up and moved south. Now this happened in October of 1862, late October. I can't say that maybe they didn't appreciate the resistance from these black folks. Because let me tell you, to be black in uniform and firing on a rebel was the worst thing in the world you could do. If they caught you, they would kill you. There was no compromise. They wanted to torture you, and if they were good to you, they returned you to slavery. So it was a no-win situation for these black guys. It was fight or die, or go back to being a slave. Neither one was acceptable. That following day, the island's empty. The troops moved on. And perhaps that's just because being so late in the autumn, they were on their way to Texas, which was usual, to winter over down in Texas and come back in the spring, renewed, and ready to fight. This was a normal habit. Battles were fewer in the winter months and fired up again in spring. But this word about these soldiers, brand new boot soldiers, black ones at that, that had not been authorized by the War Department or by President Lincoln. Harper's Ferry wrote the story. And in that story, they quoted a man from Butler, Missouri that said, those black guys fought like tigers. Well, they didn't earn the name of tiger. But these are the same folks that inspired President Lincoln and the War Department to say, wait a minute, everybody's tired of this war. It's just beginning. We thought it'd be over soon, but it's not. We're losing people. The economy is getting wrecked. And we got all this manpower that we have excluded. Let's think about it. January 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation is written, and it's issued. That one said that they could serve. Therefore, that was the first time that troops of colored men had fought on the side of the Union and had won. Have you ever heard of that movie, Glory, Massachusetts 54? It leads you to believe that the first time colored troops engaged the Confederates, they lost. That story is true. But what is the truth is that the first engagement of African American soldiers on behalf of the United States in the Union forces during the Civil War happened in Bates County, Missouri and they were victorious. So you see, it's sometimes very interesting 
to find out the truth. The one truth is, Missouri is one heck of an interesting place when it comes down to the Civil War, the battles of black and white, and what changed this nation. But it's something that was also not so well known. That even though recruited men, like my great grandfather, Isaac Johnson in 1867, May 6th, as a matter of fact, it wasn't just men that fought. Even though as far as the United States government was concerned, that was the case, but not true. People wants to know how some ladies and stuff that be around that time. And I know about a lot of stuff because I be there. I, I was a slave. My name Cassie Will. And I be in there in a penis, Missouri on the farm with 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 my mama. We be on the on the Johnson farm. I'd be just a little bitty kid. And, and I'd be around knowing stuff. You know, you, you, when you're a slave, stuff come around where you know stuff going on because you hear. A lot of time you don't know what's going on for sure. And you, you just kind of Go on about your business, and and, and sometimes you just playing with the other friends and stuff, and and stuff still going on, but you don't know that it's got something to do with you. That's that's the way it was for me. I know stuff's going on, but I don't know it's got something to do with me till I gets older. And when I, I get older, I, I be hearing stuff about uh, gray coats and, and, and blue coats. And, and I hear that they, they's mad at each other and they's going to be fighting. I, I don't understand, but I, I, I hear things and I get a little bit feared because my mama, she tell me that don't, don't go over there and don't go over there. We used to do that kind of stuff and we could go places, but now it's kind of like stay where you be and don't get out of sight. Well, when I gets to be about a, oh, around, almost around 15 or 16 year old, I guess to hear some serious stuff about people's coming and, and running folks out to, off their, their farm and making them go other places like even way over there in Kansas cause there's a fear of the blue coats where we lived and, and I don't know if my, my, my master, if, if he a fear of the blue coats Cause he be a, uh, they call a sympathizer of the gray coats. I don't know if that be right or not, but next thing I know, we all the pack up and we go down to Jeff City. They tell me that be the captain of Missouri. Well, we goes down there, and we bees on the farm, and well, bad thing happened. My my master, he died, but all us still on the farm with the rest of the Joshua family. We keeps working the farms and doing the stuff we got to do, and one day. I, Look up and I see soldiers coming down the road. And they coming 
my way, where I is, you know, on the farm, and and there's the blue coats, and when they get to where I is, they stop and they talk to me. The man, the, I think they call him Commander. He said, where your master? I said, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I know he got it. But they buried him because he died. And they said, well, we want you to go with us and you're going to help my soldiers and me and want you to do our cooking for us. I said, I, I don't cook. Don't know nothing about that. I was in the big house, but I don't cook. He said, well, it don't make no difference. We'll learn you how to cook. I ain't want to go with him, but I ain't got no say-so in the matter, so I just got to go anyway. Ain't nobody say you, you, got, you can stay here. So I go. And they learned me how to cook, and they learned me how to do the laundry, and I be doing stuff for the soldiers like he tell me. And we gets to moving on down in Missouri, and next thing I know we's in this place called Arkansas. And we end up in this place where they have this battle. A battle, of, they call it Pea Ridge. Well, where we be camp at, the battle be one place and we be camp another place. And when they come back from the battle, I see stuff I ain't never seen in my life. And I ain't liking what I see because it just make my heart sink down when I see the, the blood and the mess on them, their soldiers, their bodies all break up and huh, I ain't gonna talk about that no more because I don't like it. Where well, they pack us all up and we keep moving on down south. Next thing I know, we's in Georgia. We goes through Macon and some place called Savannah, and, and the blue coats be burning up the 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 tobacco fields, and, and oh, that's just tearing up stuff. Just, just, yeah. Well, I even see some of the boats get sank down in the river as we's going on and we just keeps on traveling. And I keeps on doing my work that I've been learning to do. Then we get some up in uh, some place called Virginia. When we get there, we meet up with this general Sheridan. He done come up from down in Shenandoah where he been raiding and stuff. That's what they tell me. I don't know no more than what folks tell me. Then he take over, take over the troops that I be in. And that other commander, he goes someplace else. Well, this, this, uh, Sheridan, man, he take us on up in Nebraska, then we come on back down in Missouri, and that be around April. And I hear something that I ain't never think I was going to hear in my life. They say, when we gets back in Missouri, Missouri done had a, a convention. And when they had that convention, they, they freed all the slaves in Missouri. 
So that means that cat is free. <laughs> free. <laughs> they say free. Free. Slaves can go where they want to go. I don't know nothing about no free cause I ain't never been there before. But I heard about it cause my papa, he was free. All I know is he don't stay around long cause he say he might get caught by them, them slave catchers. But my mama, her was free for we go down to Jeff City. And her be up there in some place called Long Jack. We leave her there when we go down to Jeff City. So I know that free is not stuck with everybody telling you what to do. I know a little bit about that free. But we's down here in St. Louis and just a break back. That's another place that uh, the soldiers hang out. And I run into a friend and, and a cousin. They tell me about a new thing going on, something called, called an act that the government does, does set up for black folks to be in the army. And they stop. They say, Captain, they say, we's in the army. We done, we done join up. You can join up. Well, I join up and I stay for 20 and two months. Time And I tell y'all, when I join up, they give me a name called Private. And they, I had to tell them my name. My name be Will Catty. That's what I tell them. Cause they can't know I ain't no man. Cause they think I'm a man. My friends say I look like a man. <laughs> uh, look like a man. Tell me something. I ain't no man. I was, a, I was a woman. But if I could be in a soldier, uh, if I could be in a soldier's army, then I be the man. And I go show y'all what I get when I join up. Cause they let me in there and they give me a, a name, Private Will Cat. Right here. See, I got, a, I got a cap and I got a belt. And this here be my backpack and my lack for when I'm out there in the wilderness and it's dark and I got to see what I'm doing. Then this is my canteen, my knapsack, and this is what I really be proud of. Cause I see them soldiers with their coats on and they go buttons. This be mine. This here, all this be mine. I, I proud of my uniform. And I wears my uniform. I be very, very. Well, I know you probably wonder about these here creatures. Well, when I filed for my pension, I got to prove to the peoples that William Catty and Captain William same peoples. They know that when they put me out. Cause they find out that I ain't no man when I get sick. And they examine me. So when I go in for my pension day, 
won't examine me to to find out stuff and, and they find out I ain't in good shape. Lots of things wrong with me. These here creatures I got to have them cause I ain't got no toes on on this here foot and I ain't got none on this here foot. But I got one toe on both of them. But I can't walk without these here creatures. And they's gonna give me a third grade pension. But then when the bowl meet up, they say I got some stuff that ain't right in, in my paperwork. So they say you can't get no pension. Well, that, that being 18 and 92, that time I was 50 year old, and I ain't got no work, can't do nothing cause of my creatures and my feet. So, they ain't get kind of bad for me. And Kathy, after that time, she was in dire straits. We know that she was really in bad shape. Uh, she wasn't able to travel. She wasn't able to take care of herself. We don't know when she died, but we do know that she died between 1892 and 1900. There's nothing to show that Kathy was alive in the census during 1900. And in 1990, after 1992, uh, a bus was made of Kathy to represent her because we don't have any real photographs of her. Uh, they wanted to put that bust on the uh, Walk of Fame up at the Fort Leavenworth, and the Army said no. Kathy was a fraud. She defrauded the Army. I said, no, that's not true. Kathy was a slave. She had nothing to work with. And when she got an opportunity, she took it. She said, I can't read and write, but I'm not stupid. And I say that Kathy did what she needed to do to make a living and survive. Well, the real story is one about the Buffalo Soldiers. Most of the time, folks ask, just what is a Buffalo Soldier? Oh, you'd hear some crazy things if you asked that question, like, are they part Buffalo? Well, not exactly, I'll say. But you know what, when it came down to fighting, maybe they were. See, the point of it is this. <clears throat> when they started enlisting black people into the United States Army, it was by an act of Congress in July 28, 1866. Well, this act changed everything. Now, don't get it wrong, because black folks fought in every battle that the United States, not every battle exactly, but every war that the United States ever managed to get itself into. Revolutionary War, 1812, Civil War wasn't the first time they fought, <clears throat> nor was it the last. But following the Civil War, after stories like Island Mound and many, many, many more, it was decided that maybe there was a use for all this free labor now. They were no longer slaves and had been emancipated. So Congress says, we've got to do something. We can admit some of them into the Army in peacetime. Never been done before. Never. Well, that's a big change. What Congress was able to do was to reorganize the Army, now that the Civil War was over, with 10 regiments. Believe it or not, six of those regiments went to black men, and including Kathy Williams. But what it was is that there were four 
regiments of infantry. For those of you that may not know, those guys walked. Native Americans at the time, some of them, had their own name for them. What they called them was walker heaps. Because what else did they do? See these guys with blue stripes on their uniforms, and they walked everywhere. That's what Kathy did. The others wore yellow like I do, and they were cavalry. Now at the time, the cavalry unit was the best fighting units we had in this country. Well, two new regiments out of 10 went to black cavalry. The 9th and 10th, they were. These guys all distinguished themselves, particularly the cavalry, because it was during that Indian War period between 1866 and 1898 that as a unit, the black soldiers, particularly the 9th Cavalry, earned more Congressional Medal of Honor awards than any other unit in all of the West during the Indian Wars. I know we hear about the West as taming of the old West, and sure there's going to be a lot of imagery out there that says this was something that was done by the white man. I'm not saying that ain't true, but I'm saying that the parallel story was that black troops were there too. And they fought some of the fiercest fights, they patrolled long and hard, they helped lay trails hang telegraph wire, and protect the workers that were building the Transcontinental Railroad. These things were all aside from being law and order in the West. Rustlers, outlaws, cattlemen, bad men, whatever. If there was no other law around, then the Army had to take that job. Now, imagine going from slave to soldier, like that fellow I mentioned. Isaac Johnson, illiterate, former slave, and now you find yourself out there on a mission. And it's a mission that either you'll complete or you'll die. Talking about dying, he did almost die. One assignment he was given was to guard the mail from Kansas to Fort Union, New Mexico. That was the spring of 1867. Cow Creek Crossing is on the original Santa Fe Trail. It's in Rice County, just west of Lyons, Kansas, along what today is Highway 56. At that crossing, there was a surprise attack on this mail train. Isaac took a bullet. He was wounded, continued to fight. Now you gotta understand the logistics and medicine of the day when we're talking about way back when there were no hospitals, towns of doctors. Here you had to get field dressing. In other words, work with the wound, dig the bullet out, patch him up, then put him back on his post, put his rifle back in his hand, and he had another 450 miles or more to go before he got to Fort Union. That's some pretty tough times. That wound bothered him until he died. But before he died, he did re-enlist out of the 38th Infantry, which had turned to the 24th after consolidation in 1870. And in 1878, he joined the 9th Cavalry. Didn't make all five years because that wound was just too aggravating, especially for a right-hand horseman. But that's just one story. There's another one about a fellow, a private, named John Randall. John was part of an eight-man crew led by a sergeant that was told to guard the workers on the railroad. Well, one day, three of them, two of them being civilians on the railroad and John Randall were sent out for fresh meat, go hunt. Didn't get too far from the camp before gunshots rang out. Just like Isaac, these guys, John Randall and the other two, found themselves under attack. Some reports say there might have been 70 in that war band that attacked them. Some of the first shots to ring out hit both 
of the railroad men, and they dropped from their saddles dead. John was wounded by a bullet, came off his saddle, and crawled underneath the railroad track that was nearby. Now, a washout is an area where the rain just continues to run down and it's washing out all the fresh dirt underneath it, but it leaves a little bit of a slot underneath there, very tight. John wedged himself underneath those railroad ties and back up in that washout. Here's something that you gotta know. I mean, I know TV and movies will let you believe that a six-shooter can fire 20 times before they throw the gun at you. Number one, a gun cost you a month's salary. You weren't gonna be throwing it away. And you didn't throw away your bullets either. So when John was assigned that duty, he was given 17 bullets. This is known, 17. So John is firing all he can. He's wounded, but he's fighting back. He's fighting for his life. But with the gunshots sounding out, here come the rest of the troops. The other seven troopers came up and they fought their way in and pushed the Indians back off of John. So it was no longer a game 70 to one. They were getting resistance. They were getting heavy fire from these fellas. So they gave up on that attack and they didn't kill John. When they pulled John out from under that washout underneath that railroad track, he had that gunshot wound, but he had 11 other stab wounds in his body but he never quit fighting. And you can imagine around the campfire back at the railroad camp and among the soldiers that were there, they were talking about how John Randall just had a spirit that was strange, but you gotta remember too, the attackers that had injured John, they saw it too. They couldn't kill him. He kept fighting. See, so that's that spirit that would not die. That's respected among a lot of tribes, that a good warrior may eventually end up lead, leading the tribe. <clears throat> well, they saw this warrior in John. Now, some folks say they call them buffalo soldiers because of the woolly hair on their head. Okay, if you want to attribute that name to a characteristic, I'm not sure that's what you would pick out while you were firing and somebody's firing back at you. The other, even more ridiculous, said, it's because they wore a buffalo robe. Even if I put on a buffalo robe and stood here right now today, I do not look like a 2,000 pound buffalo. That wasn't it. Perhaps it wasn't about a characteristic, it was about character. See, John had this spirit that would not die. He's not the only one, he's an example. And in that spirit that would not die, this is respected. A true warrior. Didn't look like the other guys they had been fighting. My goodness, these guys were dark. And these guys fought hard. They fought like life was everything to them. Well, if this word got back, you know what? You can compare it to another thing that they believed in as part of their life and their religion. That the buffalo was sacred. It meant everything to them. When the buffalo roamed, so did they. Well, knowing the buffalo better than anybody else on earth at that time, they knew that if you ever want to have trouble with a 2,000 pound mass of muscle that can outrun a horse? You don't want to wound a buffalo and you don't want to corner it because if that thing can run all day long, on stop, just keep trotting all day long. When it comes at you, it comes to kill. You're going to have more trouble out of that buffalo than anything else in the continental United States as we know it today. Well, I believe that it's the character, the fighting ability, stamina, and the heart that was shown. And people like John Randall that made the impression because the Native Americans gave the Buffalo Soldier that name. They really were called, in translation, Wild Buffalo. But some of the letters back home and some of the Eastern press got a hold of it and instead of calling those black men wild buffaloes, they call them buffalo soldiers. 
Not all folks, particularly some white folks, thought that might have been an insult. But those black troops took that as a badge of honor. Buffalo Soldier never was an official title, it was a nickname. But the thing of it is, is that if you think that their fighting was different, and in some cases it appeared to be, that same tradition of being warriors continued on and on. So the Indian Wars was just about wound down. The West was mostly tamed by 1898. But America moved from one war to another. The Indian Wars for the ninth officially ended in 1890. For the 10th, it ended in 1886. So sure, that was the official years that they ended for the ninth to 10th respectively, but they still after that had uh, skirmishes across the border, even with some of the warriors out west. So it wasn't until 1898 that the 24th, the 25th, and the 9th to 10th was summoned to Cuba. Their job was to fight along Teddy Roosevelt. One year they stayed over in Cuba. They returned in 1899. But while in Cuba, the rains were so hard and harsh that they took the Stetson and redesigned this hat. We call it a campaign hat. We call it a lemon squeeze. We call it, we even call it a Montana pink or Montana pinch. Some people label Smokey the bear hat. And that's why you see Smokey in a lot of his commercial back then. This hat is a symbol of park rangers. In 1911, the Smokey the Bear hat became the first original park ranger hat. Even though the 9th and the 24th went to California to relieve all the white troops to become park rangers. In 1916, they made the Buffalo Soldiers the first original park rangers. So they patrolled most of your big parks out there. The Sequoias, Grant, Yosemite, just to name a few of the parks that patrolled for a number of years until, in, until World War I came in. Now, you heard about the Buffalo Soldiers. You heard about it was just a given name. But in World War I, they did create some units. The 92nd and the 93rd, and they were called the Buffalo Division. So mostly they fought over in France. And as it did in the Indian Wars, the 9th and 10th never fought as a regiment in World War I. Also, that takes us to World War II, same thing. They never fought as a 9th and 10th regiment. So they sent them overseas. They became the 2nd Cavalry Division. Their job was extracted different units out of the 2nd Division. They extracted the 555, that's the triple nickel. Basically, they were called smoke jumpers. They was created here in the States, sent to Oregon, and some of them Montana and Washington State, and then some went overseas. Now the Army said they're smoke jumpers. Anytime you jump out of an airplane with a parachute, you are a parachuter. So that's the name they gave the triple nickel. They didn't really give them the paratroop. They extracted another group out of there, the Red Ball Express. Now, who are the Red Ball Express? Well, the Red Ball Express are the ones that's got a dangerous job. They took the ammo to the front line. The 9th to 10th Cavalry did this. The black soldiers did this. 30% of the Red Ball Express with Afro-Americans. And like I said before, the job was to take the ammo to the front lines. Sometimes they would beat some of the units up and wait on them. Like I said before, it's a very dangerous job. Well, they extracted another unit out of there. And I'll give you a little bit of information about them and we'll, we'll get back to That's the Red Tail. Now, I heard, heard about the Red Tail. Technically, they call it Tuskegee Air. But you know, it's like the Buffalo Soldier, they gave them that name, Red Tails. 
to distinguish himself from anyone else. And I, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the red tail. They was, they was created, and they trained in Tuskegee, Alabama. These were all Afro-American pilots. They were sent over France. Their job was overseas, North Africa, Italy, Germany. Their job was to escort bombers to Berlin. They did their job. They did it well. They was called on to escort to escort bombers to Berlin. The reason why? Because some of the bombers, they when you have a bomber, you have escort. The escorts never showed up. So they seen these red tails come come into play. They took them far as they could. At one point in time, the escorts didn't show up. They took show up. They took them on into Berlin. The red tails never lost a bomber. Therefore, they was always asked. Every time somebody wanted, they wanted the red tail. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know they were Afro American pilots. Get fly somewhere. Then there's some more units that came out of there in World War II. It's the 320th. This is an air balloon battalion. No one knows this. They call it 320th balloon battalion because in World War II. The Army do what they do now. They extract so many different units. Like I said, the 9th to 10th, they went to the 2nd Division. Some of them became the 555. Some of them became uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Some of them became different units. Then the 9th to 10th, they also was created, reorganized again. Why? In the 2nd Division. They became the 509th and the 5. 10, 10 tank division. So it's different, it's different numbers, but basically we still go back to the, the forefathers, the Buffalo soldiers. So if you look at all these units, they were stacked in 1866, all the way up to now. Now, they also were some women. They called Tuskegee Airmen women. They were nurses. Their job was to take care of the down pilots that were sick. They could not work on none of the white pallets. That was their job. So, when, when 1948 rolled around, Harry S. True, he signed something that went into effect in 1952. He signed Executive Order 9981 to integrate all military units. It didn't take effect in 1952. But then after Harry X. Truman signed that, there was two more cavalry units put on the play, the 27th and 28th. They came into play in the latter part of 48, but they were disbanded before 1950. Now, there's a, one group that we still, today, the military still, the United States Army still recommend. You know, we got to go far back past the Indian War. They recognize the Native Americans as the number one warrior of today. And to recognize these Native Americans in between 1962 and 1963, this certain unit was sent to Vietnam. They wore this green beret. If you look on their sleeve, they, they have a patch. It is resemble an arrowhead. The arrowhead represents all Native Americans was the number one warrior to this day. Now, if you look in the middle of that patch, they have a sword. That's the weapon that was used. It also has three lightning bolts across the saber. Today's model what the Green Beret was, land, sea, and air. But if you go back, the Native worker, the Native Americans started it with the arrowhead back. So we have to take our hats off to the Native American. It's just like the Native American respected the Buffalo soldiers before the way they fought. And, and that's, that is something that the uh, American Indians know now, Native Americans know. So anyway, I'll just give you a little bit of history 
of the Buffalo Soldiers, the Native Americans, where we played a part in American history. There's a lot more out there. We're still doing our researches, and, and we find different history about the Buffalo Soldiers. You know, one thing I want to share with you is that we know about the Buffalo Soldiers. People have heard about them, even though they don't know much about what, what it's all about. But as long as you've heard about the Buffalo Soldiers, and as little as you may or may not know, think of this. The Buffalo Soldiers were active for the United States for only 78 years, starting in the Indian Wars and ending in Korea. 78 years, that's one lifetime. But their contribution not only changed America, because America changed the world. Part of that engine was not just slave power, which is the economic engine, the one that made this country powerful and rich. It also is the one that gave us the resources of the West, opened this country up all the way to the coast, from sea to shining sea. What I want to do is introduce, <coughs> first of all, Kathy Williams. Donna Madison is her name, and she is the daughter of the co-founder of what is now the 9th and 10th Horse Cavalry Association, with 21,000 members and 41 chapters. Her dad, James Madison, and James Alexander are the two founders and the reason that we're here today. But I want you to know that all started 100 years after Congress signed the Authorization Act to put blacks into service during peacetime. It was July 28, 1966 that her dad and his fellow Buffalo soldiers from World War II and Korea got together and started this organization. Also that her father, James Madison, had three bronze stars from World War II. That's a war hero. The fellow over there, since I told you that this chapter started in 1966, John J.R. Bruce is only the second president in the history of this chapter. But beyond that, John is also a war hero. In combat, he earned three bronze stars with valor. He doesn't like to talk about it. But one thing we find in common about those that had experiences of war, they generally didn't talk about it. All three of us are thankful to Mid-Continent Public Library for our certification as oral storytellers, as well as the certification for written storytellers. And I encourage every one of you, you have a story to tell. You can tell it better. You can tell your name. I'll get to me. <laughs> but we're also presenting members of the Missouri Humanities Council Speakers Bureau. These are the things that we've done through Mid-Continent Library. It gave us the ability and the confidence to become speakers for the state of Missouri. My name is George Pettigrew. I'm a veteran as well. John, U.S. Army, me, U.S. Navy. It was my great-grandfather that makes me stand here today as one of the very first Buffalo Soldiers even before they earned that nickname. But we're all very happy to be with you and we hope to see you soon at Library Branch nearest you. Thank you.